Seriously, who's blowing up my phone? Oh, yeah. Powerball. Big news. Powerball now draws three days a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. Play now. Please play responsibly. Must be 18 years or older to purchase player claim. Compassion, fearlessness, humility. These are a few things nurses are made of. And after earning a degree in finance and working in an office, I realized I'm supposed to be a nurse. It's what I'm made for. So I enrolled in Marion University's accelerated 16-month nursing program designed for people with non-nursing bachelor degrees who want to transition into nursing. Devoted, brilliant, the list goes on. What are you made of? Search Marion ABSN to learn more. This is Donald Parham of the LA Chargers, and you're listening to Chargers Unleashed, part of the LA Football Network. Stay jiggy. Three, two, one. This is Chargers Unleashed Podcast. Here are your hosts, Dan Wolfenstein and Jake Hefner. Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Dan Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. Today's show, of course, being brought to you by Charger Bolt Family, Golden Road Brewery, UFC Fit in Temecula, and Tick Pick. Dan Wolkenstein, it has been a minute. And for those of you who are just turning in, if you have not seen the show before, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or wherever you choose to digest your weekly podcast. That's including Apple or Spotify. Yeah, Dan, it's been a minute, sir. Two weeks kind of seems like, you know, a lifetime. (laughs) A lifetime in the football world, considering what has taken place here in the last two weeks. Uh, Coming off the best divisional week of football that I personally have ever seen, with as much drama filled that was in that, it's a shame that the Chargers, of course, are not part of that. But that's why we're here today, Dan. That's why we're here today, because I finally get to start the conversation <laughs> about the 2022 off season. I, I knew it. <laughs> finally start to can, you know, even at this point, start to put in my little draft nuggets that I love talking about so much that we're eyeing towards April 28th. I believe if I remember correctly, when that is the <laughs> Not draft that you're counting or anything, not that I'm counting whatsoever, <laughs> but we've had, A few shakeups in the coaching ranks. Obviously, the Chargers season came to an unfortunate end. We have free agency that's on the horizon, the combine before that. A lot of things to assess, grade, and kind of turn the page on the season that was 2021 and look forward to the 2022 season. So, Dan, uh, first off, sir, how are you? I'm good. Um you know, this has been a this has been a tough playoff run to watch. Um, obviously, because the Chargers aren't in it, um, much to all of our disappointment and sadness. But you know, I, I think the the fan base I think is is now you know even hungrier. You saw the last episode of All In where they kind of talked about like what's next and building for this kind of next season. Um, but I'm not gonna lie, like watching these games the last couple weeks. Um, it's it's been kind of like bittersweet, I guess, being able to finally see other teams like go through some just absolute gut wrenching heartbreak that we have had to endure for the better part of the whole season. Um, but you're right; the last couple of weeks have been amazing, and this past weekend's football games were ridiculous. And if there's one thing that that weekend should have taught you is that you have to have an Avenger-type quarterback to win in the AFC. You just do. And what you saw with Buffalo, what you're seeing with Cincinnati, what you're seeing with, obviously, the Chiefs, like you have to have that guy. And thankfully, we have that guy. And I think that the the hardest part, and I think that's what gets you excited, Jake, and probably what gets everybody excited for this offseason now is like it's all in front of us, in front of us, in front of the team about like what's next. Like, what can we do? What do we need to get to what we saw this weekend? And if you think about it, Jake, like the Chargers beat the Bengals this season. Chargers beat the Chiefs this season. Almost beat them twice. 
the Chargers, I mean, they're they're there. There's some obviously glaring improvements they need, but I think that's what gets me excited. So when you ask how I'm doing, like I'm I'm motivated, I'm ready. Like I, I think I'm finally fully embracing, like, let's get into draft talk, let's get into free agency. Not a boy. Uh I was a little down, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> the last couple of weeks, I think we all were. Um, but I'm ready. I'm ready. I think this is a big off season. Uh, so Jake, like what, maybe the, the elephant in the room here is like, where do we go from here? Like if you're, if you're Tom Telesco, if you're Dean Spanos and you're sitting there and let's just forget what happened against the Raiders and like move on. Where do you like where where do you put your focus first? <laughs> uh so I think that we can all agree that the biggest question mark coming in to the 2021 season, we asked Fernando Ramirez about this plenty of times. Pretty much all of our guests before the season even started, Dan, just talking about how does Justin Herbert build on the rookie of the year campaign that he had in 2020? How do you build off that? Was there going to be a sophomore slump because of the change in the coaching ranks? Uh, you know, he's gone through several coordinators, even going through all of all the way back to his college days in Oregon. Is that going to affect him in the NFL ranks? And he put that notion to bed with an exclamation point this year. Uh, there was no sophomore slump. There was a fantastic year put up by him. Some of the best numbers that you could possibly ask for for a quarterback coming out in only his second season in the NFL, ranked top three and top five in several different categories. It was a fantastic year for Justin Herbert. And you could tell that the biggest priority that the Chargers went into this this prior season for was making sure that he was better protected. Because in 2020, we know the story. That offensive line was in shambles. Justin Herbert virtually had no protection, and it still is just mind-blowing the stats that he was able to put out given the circumstances. And what did Brandon Staley and Tom Telesco do? They went out and they they required Corey Lindsley with a huge free agent signing corner uh, contract. You went out and signed other low-level but productive free agents like Matt Filer, Odia Bushi. Of course, you get a gift put in your lap that Rashawn Slater was there with the number 13th overall pick to basically cover Justin Herbert's blind side for the next decade. And your offensive line took a dramatic change in the right direction and was much better in both pass and the run. Wasn't able to fix all of the tackle positions, unfortunately, however, but you made a good faith effort at it and it showed it showed. However, Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. <laughs> there, there is no question what the Achilles heel of this Chargers team was this season. And even with players the likes of Joey Bosa, Derwin James, even some of your rookie draft picks and Asante Samuel Jr., even the way Kaiser White was playing this year, you really felt like there were there was enough talent to make things happen. Nasir Adderley had a fantastic season. But even despite all of that, the Chargers could never really correct their deficiency in stopping the run. Never could do it. Or or stopping the pass on third down, to be honest. (laughs) No. There's there's terrible stats that we could basically make an entire episode on, on why this defense was so porous. And again, I go back to that saying from the movie Miracle where Kurt Russell says, you're not talented to win on talent alone. The Chargers have a talented team, but there is something specifically on the defensive side that just did not click in the year 2021. Whether We'll talk about the depth aspect in a second because that is a big part of it. Tom Telesco in his press conference took personal responsibility that he felt that the defense was going to progress more than it was, felt that they took a huge step back, did not meet the expectations that he was looking for. And when you look at it in the key games that really cost the Chargers the playoffs, the Minnesota Vikings game, Denver Broncos game, 
obviously the Houston Texans game. Not to say that Justin Herbert was flawless in any of those because he wasn't, but the defense really just was a huge Achilles heel. And while Justin Herbert could score and at certain points looked like he could score at will, he unfortunately was given so little opportunities to do so that every possession that he had, you just felt that the Chargers had to score in order to stay in the game. So when you can't create turnovers and you can't stop the ball, or stop the run, or get an opposing offense off the field on third down, not only does it gas your defense, but it puts your quarterback in a tough position too because it limits his opportunities, and especially if the opposing offense is score, you're basically just playing catch up the, the, the remainder of the game. Several times in this season when the Chargers could score and you feel like they're back in the game, the defense on the next series would just automatically let you down. And it was just such a deflating experience. So if you're asking me, where do the Chargers start looking for 22, 2022? There's no question that you need to put the same emphasis both on free agency and the draft that you did into your offensive line last season. You know, it was, it's a good point, Jake. Like I I was sitting there watching that Bills Chiefs game and we can go on and on about how crazy that game was and whatnot. But that game felt like a microcosm of almost every time the Chargers lost this season for the most part, where like Josh Allen is doing godly things for that Buffalo team and putting the team on his back and not letting them lose. And then the defense just gets carved every time. And you feel bad for Josh Allen. Like, you feel bad for some of those guys. You're like, you got to be kidding me. Like, how are you losing this game? And there are just some guys that you go up against where you can't stop them. But like the larger issue is like you have to build a roster that can at least somewhat contain things like that. And the Chargers just couldn't. In those gotta have it times, it really didn't matter who they were playing for the most part. Like in those gotta have it, gotta have it downs on third down on defense, whether it was getting gashed by the run, whether it was an untimely pass that was going to a cornerback four whether it was a horrible penalty, guys missing tackles. Like it just, the lack of execution just was Don't not forget there. the dropped passes. <laughs> yes. Drop passes and drop interceptions. If you want to get crazy. Um, so, so what's next? Like, I, you know, I think everyone would agree that the chargers need to improve their defense. Like I don't think anyone out there that's like, Oh, chargers need to focus on offense and we don't need to worry about defense. Like that's obvious. But I guess I guess the part that is is kind of questionable to me is what is the most important part of the defense that needs to get fixed? Because going up against teams like the Bills, like the Chiefs, like for the most part, like the Bengals, Titans outlier, they're a different kind of category. Like interior run defense isn't what costed the games. Hold on. Like you're watching Patrick Mahomes, you're watching Joe Burrow, you're watching Josh Allen, like do magician type stuff. Like you're not watching Clyde Edwards Hilaire and running backs gashing those teams. Although they probably could, but that's not what loses a game in 13 seconds. Like interior defensive line isn't losing the games for us like what we've seen. Now, the first the first 60 minutes, sure. <laughs> like the interior defensive line is certainly could be better, but I guess the question is like what's next? What is more important? Like fixing the run defense or shoring up the ability to contain on the back end? I mean, it's kind of a little bit of both. In my opinion, the Chargers have always had problems containing mobile quarterbacks, and that goes for the likes of Patrick Mahomes, Russell Wilson. You know, you take any mobile quarterback, the Chargers have had issues with outside. Marcus Mariota. That's been 
that's been an issue for years, Dan. But to me, the really big defining one was the interior of the defensive line. I told you before the season started, back when we started breaking down the positional training camp battles, that the depth of this interior defensive line really, really worried me. And when you look at your starters that you had with Justin Jones, Linval Joseph, and Jerry Tillery, the Chargers were a different team when Justin Jones was out for that short period of time. Linval Joseph, I thought, after his COVID stint, took a little bit of in step back as far as his impact that he had on the team. Jerry Tillery was just Jerry Tillery. He still has not blossomed into the player that we thought that we were getting from Notre Dame in the first round. Did he have a better season than he did last year? I would say yes, but it's not by a wide margin. I thought that the way that they were utilizing him was better than how Gus Bradley utilized him the prior year. I felt like he had those moments where he was getting pressure from the interior and was able to get some of those rushes on the passers. That was that was a positive thing to see. But then there'd be other times where you look at him and you're just like, oh, man, dude, it's just like that's that's the Jerry Tillery from a year ago that we didn't want to see. So you're you're still just not quite there yet. And now when you look at it with both Linval Joseph and Justin Jones being pending free agents this upcoming season, no, I didn't even mention Christian Covington. So that's potentially three defensive tackles that you may not have going into this year. You you have to close this up and do it in a different way than, in my opinion, just getting big guys who can stop the run. Justin Jones, I think if you're asking me, is the priority out of both all three of those guys to bring back in terms of free agency goes, but you need to go out and you need to fortify it a little bit better. We've all heard the Akeem Hicks talks because the Brandon Staley conversations um, we we've heard other players that have former familiarity with Brandon Staley, such as Sebastian Joseph day also plays for the Rams. Uh, Other guys like, uh, like DJ Jones for the 49ers. These are these are guys who are going to come on the market that you need to have that are a little bit better in doing a little bit of both, Dan. Not just guys who can are win tr- one trick ponies and stopping the run. I love those type of guys. Don't get me wrong. I love the guys who could take on the double teams and create other plays for other players. And if you get those guys, that's great. But Take a look at what Tom Brady had to face this week against the Rams, the interior pressure that he was under. Yes, I understand he didn't have Tristan Wirfs, but that's traditionally how you have beaten Tom Brady in during his time in the NFL. When you can win with four instead of having to rush five and dropping seven into coverage, you got a better chance at winning more battles. And this is the same against the likes of a Josh Allen or a Patrick Mahomes because we've seen it happen before. You get that type of interior pressure with four guys and having that flexibility to have more guys in coverage and cover more ground in the field, that's how you can win on the defensive side of the ball. That's how you can create takeaways. That's how you can create mistakes. And it has to start up front, in my opinion, with an interior defensive line. If this gets fixed, you'll see better production off of Joey Bosa because you won't have to see double teaming Joey Bosa. And even if you do, that's going to free someone else who can be more productive. I know I know Nchenna Nwosu really came on toward the end of this season and looked good doing it. See the Chiefs game, the second Chiefs game. See the Raiders game in the, in the last game of the season. But the Chargers need to be better at a little bit of both, especially in moving forward and who they're going to be bringing in to shore up the interior of this defensive line. So, so I think this is probably where I think most of the chargers fans and probably the chargers staff as well is trying to figure out like there's a ton of things that chargers can slash should do this off season. And there are priorities across the board. I mean, we could talk about, Mike Williams extension. We could talk about Nuosu, Kaiser White. We could talk about the interior defensive line. We could talk about like getting more secondary assistance. We could talk about like a, a right tackle. We could talk about fixing special teams. There's, like, there's, there's so many things that the Chargers need to do. Um, 
but I think you're right in the sense that like they they have if the if the offense stays as is, like literally if nothing changes on offense and the Chargers put as much focus on the defense as they did on the offense last offseason, I think the team is good. I think the team is good. The team is a playoff team. Now, should they do things on offense? Absolutely. So maybe, so I guess maybe that's a good kind of segue in terms of like offseason priorities, right? We, we talked about like you got to fix the interior defensive line. If there's like a checklist or a wish list for Jake Hefner in terms of like three to five things that if the Chargers do blank, insert three to five things, this offseason was a success. And the reason I'm asking this question is because there's so many people who have been clamoring for, you know, is Tom Telesco on the hot seat? Is Brandon Staley a good head coach? Is it the player's fault? Is it the GM's fault? And you kind of move the goalposts. So if they fix one thing and then something else moves, all of a sudden, like, people are freaking out and they're saying they're bad, but they don't actually, like, put anybody in line with what they're looking for. So, like, I challenge you, myself, everyone listening and watching, like, what would a successful offseason be for you? And then we can literally take a whiteboard, put check marks and see if they do it. But I'm curious, like from your perspective, like three to five things they have to do to be successful. Well, first of all, I'll tell you what side of the fence I'm under when people will, you know, the, the criticism that came up on, under Brennan Staley, especially after the last game of the season, Tom Telesco. So first of all, Brennan Staley is in, in his first year as a head coach. Okay. It's not going to be flawless people. It's just not, it's just not. And there's no reason why we should have expected otherwise. It was nice to see that the chargers get off to a fast start as opposed to the slow starts that they normally got off to. Uh, I told Dan this, one of during our last episode, maybe it was even after the Houston game, Dan, that you would ask me, is this Charger season considered a failure? And unfortunately, I had to say, yes, it was. And that was because of how the Chargers started. That was because of the position that they were still in, When you, especially when you look at the games like Houston and the one against Denver that they dropped. Those are two games that could have saved you in the playoffs. Dan, the last four games of the season, because of everything that happened with other teams, the Chargers only had to go 500 in their last two games, and they went one and three. One and three. One and three. And so, yes, everything considered that, when you look at it that way, it's a failure, and unfortunately it is. But in my opinion, and I, Dan, I will continue to say this throughout the rest of the offseason, and I'm sure everybody else will, the seat has never been hotter than it is right now for Tom Telesco. He has a multitude of draft picks going into this season. The most cap space that he has ever had during his time as the GM. You have to make things happen by signing your own, as you had talked about in your press conference, signing some free agents that are going to make an impact on this team. Unfortunately, Tom Telesco's all of his free agents have not worked for one reason or another, and it's just unfortunate that the ball has not dropped that way for him. And when it comes to the draft, you have to hit on a number of different levels. Dan, if we just went back for a second and you look at the Chargers draft of 2020. 2020. Obviously, your first thought is going to be the Chargers got Justin Herbert. It was a great selection. You know, it could have been different if if the Miami Dolphins ended up selecting one pick ahead and we were talking about a much different situation here if Tua ended up being the Chargers quarterback. But thankfully, it didn't. And there were a lot of other directions that the Chargers couldn't have gotten at six, and they didn't. And they decided to go with Justin Herbert, and it has paid off huge dividends. But when you look at the rest of the draft picks, Dan, beyond Justin Herbert, listen to this. You traded back up in the first round for Kenneth Murray, which we'll have to talk about that in a little bit because it's at this point right now, it's not good. You take 
you would basically eliminate your third round draft selection that you had because you traded back up. You had to, you didn't pick again until round four. That's when you took Joshua Kelly. Then you took Joe Reed in round five. Round six, you took Alohi Gilman. And round seven, you took KJ Hill. So you have Kenneth Murray, who had a very unfortunate 2021 season. Couldn't even really figure out how to utilize him. Joshua Kelly has not developed into really a strength of this running back unit whatsoever. The Chargers are, hell, the Chargers are still looking for a number two guy to have behind Austin Eckler as we speak. Joe Reed was basically non-existent throughout this entire season battling injuries. They recently had just signed him to a, a future contract for this next coming season. Loie Gilman, depth piece at safety, it's fine. He had a couple plays here and there, but nothing of huge impact. And K.J. Hill, who started off this year as your kick returner and essentially wide receiver five or six, is basically not on the roster anymore. So realistically, the only impactful players from that draft, impactful, one. I mean, I will say, I think Alohi Gilman, I would give him credit. Like, he's 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 been impactful on defense. Like, he's a solid depth piece. But I, 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 I get saying. it. As, 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 as a six-round pick, it's just like, you look from where Justin Herbert was drafted to where he was drafted, and in between there, you can't tell me that anybody else has had an impact on this team. Right. Like, those are the only two guys. It's, it's, it's aside from Justin Herbert, it's actually one of Tom Telesco's worst draft classes that he's ever had. And thankfully, you got another gift handed to you in this past draft with Rashawn Slater. You had Asante Samuel Jr. that you were able to get in the second round. Obviously, what you had gotten with other guys like Trey McKitty. uh, Obviously, Brennan Hymas is a a nice little future depth piece that could possibly turn into something. Mark Webb showed flashes of that. Josh Palmer. Josh Palmer. Apologies that I had missed him. Chris Ruff. Uh, Yes. So... That was a little bit better, but Dan, this has to be all put together now because the depth on this team really reared its ugly head yep. in this season, both offensively and defensively. Do you Tom Telesco, so quick, quick, go ahead. Quick question on that. So you mentioned like the draft picks, right? We got 11 draft picks. Would you rather the Chargers keep 11? And just give our give ourselves more of a chance to to hit or trade. I know you hate trading up, but like generally speaking, do you want to have eleven more than eleven, less than eleven? Look, it's I'm not entirely opposed to trading up. Do I like having more draft picks? Yeah, who the hell doesn't? And especially on a team that you really need as much depth as you can, I would prefer that. But it, the other side of that coin, Dan, is that if you do trade up, who is it that you're trading up for? Because Tom Telesco has done this a few times. He traded up for Melvin Gordon when he shouldn't have done that. Traded up for Kenneth Murray when clearly the results show that he shouldn't have done that either. So, no, I, I don't particularly like it when Tom Telesco trades up. <laughs> now, if you were if you go all the way back to one of the best trade trade ups in possible history and looking at what the Chiefs did and trading up from twenty seven to ten to grab Patrick freaking Mahomes, <laughs> you can't deny that that has paid off dividends for them. So I'm not totally opposed to trading up. It's who are you taking when you're trading up? I th- I think that the crazy part for me is. You're right in that I think the depth is something that this team has to fix. And I don't know why this just dawned on me, but Jake, the Chargers can overhaul literally a fifth of their roster, more than a fifth of their roster on draft picks alone, if they so choose. Now, will they? I mean, 11 out of a 53-man roster, I mean, I doubt that 11 are going to make the team. But like, that's what's ahead of them. And you would think that with 11 draft picks plus a boatload of cash, like they're in a good place. Now, sure. Can we say, oh, we're just being homers and just same old chargers? I mean, sure, you could talk like that. But like they do have a good opportunity. And so maybe, so going back to like the specifics, so like we don't got to go into like specific free agents or specific draft picks, draft prospects, excuse me. 
But like, what are the the areas that Tom Telesco slash Brantley have to check off that like they have to fix blank? Three to five, you're on the hot seat. Go. Yeah, we we talked about it. Obviously, you got to find some way to to fortify that. Uh, defensive line. So I foresee the Chargers doing that in the same fashion that they did with the offensive line. I see them going out and picking up not one, but two free agents to help come in and strengthen that D line. And then on top of that, mixing in a high draft pick with another high draft pick. A high draft pick. Yes. Uh, Possibly round one or two. And then maybe in three or four, you draft another one. Uh, You're going to see a heavy, you should see a heavy, uh, commitment to the defensive line this year. That's that's no question about it. You have to fix that number one. And wait, where um, does and on the on the defensive line, where do you put edge in priority? There is it a priority for you? I, I think it. De- I think it depends on who the player is that we're talking about. Is it is it a fix? That's going to depend on Incheon Nwosu. Obviously, if he returns, that's going to depend on the development of Chris Rump. Um, Kyler Fackrell is going to be a free agent coming this year. He was only signed to a one-year deal, so maybe you need to shore that up a little bit more to give a little bit more assistance to Joey Bosa. Um, But I guess if we were to do this sequentially in order, Dan, the first things first is you think about free agency. And as Tom Telesco likes to say, you sign your own. Obviously, the big one that everybody goes to is Mike Williams going to return. Mike Williams... Came to a con- came to a contract year and he cashed in on it dramatically. <laughs> do I think that he has earned a new contract with the Chargers? Yes, I do. Now it's kind of going to be like that Hunter Henry type question, though. Where are you going to put him? And it's really we're talking really a difference in a rank here of maybe about three point five to four million difference, depending on what his market's going to be, who's going to be in contention for him. Are you going to get it a bidding war? Do you think you should do that? Uh, is Josh Palmer ready to take the next step? Dan, I even said this to you. I said that the Chargers drafting Josh Palmer last year was almost like a shot across the bow as a warning that if Mike Williams did not end up producing, that that was going to be their fallback option. I don't see how you can't sign Mike Williams, given what he did for this team this <laughs> last year. And yes, was it the most productive year during the time that he has been here? Yes. But I think this is one of the things that as much people want to give Joe Lombardi flack for, Joe Lombardi reinvented the way that the Chargers utilized Mike Williams this year. And it paid off huge dividends. If there's one thing you could point to, that is one thing that definitely happened with Joe Lombardi's arrival. You look at the rest of the times and how Anthony Lynn, and Shane Steichen utilized him. Extremely different. Simply a down threat. Jump ball catcher. That was it. Mike Williams reinvented himself. Bet on himself. And he's about to cash in big time. Uh, when you look at some other ones, Dan... And this is one that really unfortunately scares me because there's a couple reasons of why I think that this may not happen. I fully believe in my heart that this defense pff, is not going to be I'm able afraid to... afraid of what you're about to say, and I think I know to. what it is, and it makes me sad already. Yes. Uh, this defense became a different animal with how Kaiser White performed this year. And no question about it, go look at the stats. Kaiser White deserves a new contract and hopefully gets it from the Chargers. But one way or another, he deserves to be paid. Somebody is going to pay for him. There's no way you can ignore the stats of what he did. Here's what makes me extremely terrified for this. And I know a lot of people have this same type of feeling. So real quick, is Kaiser White... You're kind of like second priority. It's pretty damn or third, close. Or third, to, it's it's pretty damn close to Mike yeah. Williams, to be perfectly okay. honest. Because what he meant to this defense, and for the, I get, I guess if you want to say one of the few bright spots of the defense, he was one of the brightest. Mm-hmm. So to me, it's almost one A one B because you see the type of tandem that he and Drew Tranquil made with one another. But here's what scares me. 
you tried to utilize Kenneth Murray as an edge rusher because Kaiser White essentially took his starting job from what he had in 2020. So you basically said, well, I'm not going to take Kaiser White off the field and replace him with Kenneth Murray. I'm not going to take the better player off the field. So I'm going to try to use Kenneth Murray at, at the edge rushing position. And we all saw that failed miserably. Now, fast forward to what Tom Telesco said in his most recent press conference. Basically admitted and said, he is an inside linebacker. That's what he is. And we'll work on that moving forward. Tom Telesco that we have seen when it comes to draft picks, Dan, and we've seen it sometimes and even in free agency moves, is extremely reluctant to move on from or admit a mistake and pull the trigger. I have a huge fear that because of the fact, not only in that this is only going to be Kenneth Murray's third year in the league, but It's what the Chargers invested in him. Remember, you traded up for Mm -hmm. Kenneth Murray and spent an extra second or an extra first round pick on him. Spring it on with 40 to 70% off almost everything at Gap Factory and GapFactory.com. Matching styles for the family are on sale too. Shop it all through April 12th. Compassion, fearlessness, Humility. These are a few things nurses are made of. And after earning a degree in finance and working in an office, I realized I'm supposed to be a nurse. It's what I'm made for. So I enrolled in Marion University's accelerated 16-month nursing program designed for people with non-nursing bachelor degrees who want to transition into nursing. Devoted, brilliant, the list goes on. What are you made of? Search Marion ABSN to learn more. I have a sneaking suspicion, and I hope to God that extra I'm sec- wrong. Extra, you spent a second-round pick. You swapped first and spent a second. Whatever. He was a first-round pick at the end of yeah. the day. Yes, I get your point. I have a sneaking suspicion, and I hope to God that I am wrong, that Tom Telesco may be arrogant enough to let Kaiser White walk just from the standpoint mm. alone to say, I have this guy that I spent a lot on, that I've invested a lot on. We need to have him grow rather than me spend the money on the guy who was the better player. And Adrian Phillips is a prime example of that type of mistake. It is. And... (laughs) The more and more I think about it, and the more then the closer that we get to free agency, <laughs> I'm gonna think on this even more and be even more terrified as this gets closer. Now, the the one thing that I do, I mean, I will fully admit, like that was a miss. I think everyone was upset when Agent Phillips was not resigned. And then to see what he got signed for, and then to see where he went to, and then to see how well he did, it's like you've got to be kidding me. I believe that Brandon Staley and this coaching staff has a much larger say and a much larger voice than the previous coaching regime in terms of talent acquisition and re-signings. I think they're going by way of Brandon Staley. Like in Brandon Staley, we trust and they're not going to let him do everything, but they're going to kind of lean that way. So it seems. I just have a hard... I'm just picturing that conversation. Okay, We've all seen what type of person he is. We've all seen how aggressive he is, what he looks for in players, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If I'm Tom Telesco, hey, Brandon, I know we really like that Kaiser kid. He had a year to remember, best year of linebacker in probably 10 years. I know we really want to resign him, but I think we're going to have to be cheap and probably stay with Kenneth because like, we put a lot of money in that. And like... I get you want to have the best player out there, but I really think Kenneth Murray can be that guy. Like, do you honestly think that Brandon State is going to sit there and be like, okay. Like Brandon, if he seems like the coach that would lose a freaking gasket. If someone came up to him and told him, we're not going to sign that guy because of whatever off the field reasons we have. He could be like, take it and shove it. There's no way. I, I, and maybe I am being overly optimistic. And maybe I'm putting too much faith in Brandon Staley. 
the Chargers, there's there's literally no excuse for the Chargers to not bring back Kaiser White. They have the cap space. They have the need. They have the scheme. He has the talent. Like, it's all there. And you heard Tom Telesco talk about, like, one of the priorities is kind of keeping those that he brought in already and developed. And Kaiser White's one of those. And he, Kaiser White is, like, one of the biggest success stories of Tom Telesco's career, if you think about it. And so you have him as maybe, like, a two or three priority list. I have him up there as arguably number one priority for the chargers. Oh, he's, he's one, a one B almost interchangeable with Mike Williams. That's how close that I have it. And in the, the one part that I think is interesting and I love Mike Williams. I want Mike Williams to be on this chargers team. I think he deserves a contract and I think he's a very good, very, very, very good wide receiver. I'm pretty sure. I don't know if I have the numbers in front of me, but I'm pretty confident that Mike Williams, when he's, when he signs his new contract, if it's with the chargers, he'd be the top paid wide receiver two in the league. I can't think of another wide receiver two that would be getting much money as he is. So do you want to have the highest paid wide receiver two, or if worst case, one of the highest paid wide receiver two. Now, the second question I have, that I pose is I'm not going to answer it, but I'm going to ask it. Do you honestly think that Justin Herbert slash this offense needs Mike Williams? This Mike, this Mike Williams, not yes, yeah, this Mike Williams, not prior Mike Williams. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's a huge benefit. Okay. It, I, it's really, a benefit, but I'm asking, yeah. do they need like they need Kaiser White? Like they need that kind of player. Well, Dan, let me ask you a question. I mean, are you that confident that Josh Palmer is going to be no. able to spell Mike Williams? Okay, great. It, it do you think that Jalen Guyton is no. able to spell Mike Williams? Nope. Okay, fantastic. I think you just answered your own question right there because, I would, but I don't. If, I, I don't. That's wait, the, that, if, that's the, Look, if that's the case, then are you telling me that you're going to go out and spend almost equal amount of money to what you could have signed Mike Williams for and go out and get another free agent wide receiver? No, I'm not talking about Devontae Adams because Devontae Adams has not come into the Chargers. And anybody that is thinking that is going to happen as a realistic possibility, stop it now because it's not taking place. Why... Why would you do that? Just saying. If if you could have Mike Williams at X number, why would you go out and sign someone else at another high rate number? Now, to me already, even though Mike Williams re-signing with this team is a high priority and, and hopefully should happen, you're already wrapping up a lot of your projected $72 million in cap space up in two wide receivers that you have in both Keenan Allen, who got recently paid, and now Mike Williams. So regardless of the fact of whether Mike Williams stays or he walks, you're going to have to go and do that. But I guess I guess what I'm trying to get at is there are many options for the Chargers to fulfill a wide receiver to need. Although you can argue like Mike Williams is kind of like wide receiver 1B. Like he might not even be wide receiver 2 by the end of next year, given how impressive he was this year. There's a lot of free agents. There's a lot of guys in the draft. I know you've looked at some of them that mm-hmm. like have that similar quality. Look, let me just... Look, it would be a lot subject, cheaper. Since you're on the subject right now, let me just go ahead and name off to you some of the wide receivers that are going to be free agents this upcoming season. Allen Robinson for Chicago. I know he's one you've actually had your eye on, Dan. Chris Godwin coming off an injury. Who knows how much that's actually going to impact his market. I still think he's, think he's going to get a, a, a good contract for himself and find some good value. Devontae Adams, I've already said it. Don't think about it. It's not happening. Will Fuller, Jamison Crowder, T.Y. Hilton, Juju Smith-Schuster, Emmanuel Sanders, A.J. Green. And from there, it really... Odell Beckham. Stop it. Stop. I know you're 
clamoring for that. And I know because the number looks good, but I mean, come on. Come on. I'm not, I mean, I'm not, I'm not even saying Odell Beckham has wide receiver too. I'm just saying you forgot to mention him. Yes, I, I get that. So does any, those are, those are the top guys as far as money wise goes. Obviously the production doesn't match up with the number that those guys are getting paid. But those are the biggest name guys that are free agents for this upcoming season. And really. you could argue Mike Williams is probably, other than Devontae Adams. Dan, and who, if, knows if, if, who knows who knows Godwin with the I ACLs. know where you're going with this. You look at Devontae Adams, Chris Godwin, and Mike Williams are probably the ones that produce the most for this team. And yet... Chris Godwin and Devontae Adams as far as cap hit and what they were getting paid for this season. They're the ones that actually lived up to their contract. Allen Robinson, Dan, for crying out loud, you know how much he was getting paid this season and how, <laughs> how little he produced for his team? I mean, it's it was a damn shame for him. Will Fuller is just behind Devontae Adams as far as contract numbers goes. Which is insane. And that's in Miami. Jamison Crowder's right behind that. So Mike Williams deserves to get paid, is going to get paid. I agree. But when you look at the rest of the wide receivers out there, at most I see a good handful of these guys being wide receiver three at best. None of these guys outside of the big names that we talked about that aren't coming here, by the way, to me can spell Mike Williams. But do they need to? I, but so again, I'm, we're, we're going to get into this later. But like, when you think about this Chargers offense, like, let's just say for whatever reason, Mike Williams is gone. Let's say he he gets a twenty four million dollar a year contract from the Jaguars. I don't know, making something up. I don't think you have to just bring in another Mike Williams type for this offense to be successful. Like, I think there's you many different so. wide receiver archetypes that can come in and kind of transform this team. So like, I don't want to just be pigeonholed that we have, like I want Mike Williams back. I'm saying that right now. I want him back. But if he's wanting like 22 million a year, like I'm, I'm just saying like there are other options. So priorities for you so far, it seems like it's been got to fix the interior defensive line. You got to resign Kaiser white and Justin Jones. And I heard you mention him. Yes, um, Mike Williams. Those those are your big three as far as keeping yeah. your own goes. Now, there's there's obviously a lot more down the line that aren't as big of a priority, and you'll probably end up getting them at less money. Ode Ibushi being one of them, uh, bringing right. Him but back we're, we're getting when, we're getting like the the top things that the Chargers have to do this off season. So you mentioned right. three so guys are resigning outside of signing your own, outside of fixing the interior defensive line. I'd also say you do you are going to have to put a priority on fixing your right tackle situation. Storm Norton obviously is not the mm -hmm. answer. Trey Pipkins, while in the few times that he started this year, performed admirably, I still think he's a better developmental piece. Now, you start looking at the developmental guys and the depth behind the offensive line. If Trey Pipkins can keep developing in the right direction and can play either tackle spot, that's great. If you have Brendan Hymas, who may not, who may or may not start next year, but let's just say for the sake of argument now, if he is your depth piece, he can pretty much play anywhere across the line. Scott Questenberry at the center position. That those are nice depth pieces to have that could step in if need be. So the if you start looking at the right tackle free agent market, I don't see that's where the Chargers are going to go because it's extremely weak as far as free agent right tackles goes. So don't be surprised. Do not be surprised. As much as I have talked about the interior, the defensive line, and how high of a priority that is, and the Chargers are going to uh, definitely spend draft picks on it and high draft picks, which they will, do not be surprised if, if the way that the draft falls, if you don't see another offensive tackle going to them at 17. And I, trust me, I know it's not the sexy pick, but what are we talking about here? Protecting your investment in your quarterback. And when you go along the offensive line, the Achilles heel of that offensive line this year, no question about it, was at the right tackle spot. So if you can fortify your edges 
that was only going to help this offense that much more. Okay, so we've got we've got right tackle. We've got resign your own, fix the interior defensive line. Those are your three buckets. Four. You got to get some better depth in the secondary. Whew. I agree. You got to get some better depth in the yeah, secondary. A lot of it. <laughs> Asante <laughs> Samuel it. Jr. had an up and down year. Obviously, suffered two concussions. He was out for a minute. Mike Davis had had moments at best. Uh, we were hoping for better when he was, he was given okay. a big contract by okay. the Chargers. He he was mediocre. That's that's what you could say about him. Uh, Chris Harris, unfortunately, I do not see returning with this Chargers team. Uh, you need to find yourself a good CB3 that can cover the slot in this game. And whether that's through free agency or the draft, that needs to to be a priority. Too many times was the... It, I feel like we're almost on repeat saying this every single year, but just the middle of the field, the Chargers just seem so exposed. And the middle of the field is always wide open against this team that it can't just be Drew Tranquil and Kaiser White covering it. You have to have someone else who can shut that down. So you have to find yourself a good CB3 that can assist. CB3, CB4, well, CB4, CB5, CB6. Yes, that's true. Yes, that's true. Because when you see who is beyond <laughs> Mike Davis and Asante Samuel Jr., if they go down, God forbid, there ain't much there that's any better. So – yeah, you're you're gonna see some priority in in the in your cornerback depth as well, and so don't be surprised if you see one, maybe two of the draft picks that they have with their eleven spent on that. Who knows? But uh, for me, those are my top four priorities. And then if we're gonna say number five, five may happen sooner rather than later, given what's happening with the coaching shift. But special teams was still an issue this year. Did it get better with the acquisitions of Andre Roberts um, and Dustin Hopkins? Yes, it did. But when it comes to overall returns, coverages, punts, kickoffs, as a unit, Dan, you have the stats. What did they <laughs> rank? Uh, so the the crazy part is Andre, Ro- like you mentioned it, Andre Roberts, Dustin Hopkins, like completely transformed this team from being like literally the worst in the NFL to like actually pretty darn good, but pretty good in a few categories, but terrible still in others. So we all know Andre Roberts does pretty darn good at kickoff returns and completely transform that side chargers return game, which is pretty remarkable yards for return. Jake, do you know the Chargers were ranked number four in the NFL? With 25 yards per return. And this is kick return. Hmm. And who to thank for that? Andre Roberts. My goodness, the dude. It's a was, so that a, was, that, was that of like the seven times that they actually allowed him to, to get a <laughs> return back? Other than uh, that, they just kicked it no, off in well, the end zone. Apparently, he, apparently, the Chargers had 39 kick returns this year. So, kick return. Again, kick return. Not punt return. Kick return. Very good. You'll notice the theme here. Now, guess where the Chargers ranked on punt returns? Take a wild guess. Enlight- enlighten me. Take a wild guess. Wild guess. I don't need to guess because I know where you're going to go. I just want to hear you say it. That's all. Dead last. And like dead last by a lot. 5.9 yards per punt return. Next closest is the Dolphins. At, at almost a full yard more, 6.6. 5.9, dead last by a mile. But they're fourth in, in kick return. They got a fixed punt return. And that, I think, is more of, an, of a showcase of that our depth and our special teams coverage unit is so bad. Like... There's nobody blocking you. Like you watch the Chargers punt returns, and the guys either getting smashed or running right into his guys. There's there's no room, and that comes from like lack of depth in special teams that have good players able to block for you. Like 
And you see that on both sides of the ball. So I talked to you about kick and punt return coverage or kick with punt returns. Look, look at the other side now on defense, how much they allow yards per return on kick return. Seriously, who's blowing up my phone? Oh, yeah. Powerball. Big news. Powerball now draws three days a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. Play now. Please play responsibly. Must be 18 years or older to purchase player claim. They are middle of the road. I want to say they're like 12th, I think. I want to say, yeah, 12th. The 20.8 yards per kick return. Like, not bad. I think going into the season, Chargers would take middle of the road or top 15 all day long. Now, punt returns, yards per return, 30th. <laughs> 11 yards per punt return given up. And I felt like that happened every game. You're like, ah, I don't want to watch this. So, like, special teams, but punt coverage, punt unit specifically, really needs an overhaul. And if you look at what we did with Ty Long, like, he wasn't very good this last year. And then you look at how close he was to, like, 15 different punt blocks. There is a lot that has to change there. And so... I think the kick return, a lot of that was fixed with Andre Roberts because he can just do special things. But there's a lot less space as a punt returner, man. And that's the special team that has to get fixed. So the good news is with 11 draft picks, you would think a lot of those draft picks would be able to assist and contribute to special teams. You would think. Look at like a Chris Rumpf and what he was able to do. Look at what Mark Webb would have been able to do if he actually was able to play. Ryan Smith was a free agent, but he was supposed to be like our special teams god, never played. So look at Drew Tranquil. Look at Kyler Fackrell was out there for a bit. Like there's a bunch of guys that contribute there, but you have to have enough dudes to be able to do it. And you can't rely on like a Tavon Campbell and a Keeman Hall and a, you know, we, we like Chris Rumpf, but like he can't be like your star special teams player. So special teams has to get fixed. I probably would put that. I mean, I probably put that at number five in terms of priorities. It's it's well. I mean, your road to that is as far as priorities getting fixed. Obviously, and we all know about what took place just a couple of weeks ago and Darius Swinton being relieved of his duties. And I I thought for a second that you know that that was actually a very surprising move, just given what had taken place with Andre Roberts and what had taken place with Dustin Hopkins. And yes, after week six, the Chargers special teams as a whole gradually little by little started to get better. So you felt that it was almost like, okay, was this, was this the beginning of a kind of a, a coaching change throughout special teams and defense, or it was just, was Darius Swinton looked at the fall guy, but then Dan, as you had said, looking at the numbers, just, that's not going to cut it, unfortunately, for this Chargers team. You definitely need to be more impactful in both return capabilities and coverage capabilities. And I mean, you could literally argue that Dustin Hopkins and Andre Roberts were the only positives from the special team this year. That's about it. That's about it. But I do like that the fact that the Chargers took that in a circumstance and by this example even though I feel bad for Darius Swinton because I really liked Darius Swinton. I liked what I heard from him as a coach. You go back and you listen to any of his interviews. I just like the attitude that he approached this unit with. Um, and I, I trust me, it was a little bit surprising. I definitely didn't th think that he was going to get let go. But I also take it as a standpoint of, okay, statistically, the Chargers as a unit were not good. And this is the way that Brandon Staley and Tom Telesco chose to move on from it. and hopefully are able to improve. And so when you look at some of the guys that they are uh, been keying in on, people have already been connecting the dots. You look at Chris Tabor, who Brandon Stilley had a relationship during his time in Chicago. More recently, uh, Thomas McGahee, who has gained a lot of interest from the Panthers as of late. Is he at all uh, related to Willis McGahee? Do you know? N no, it's not. It's it's definitely not spelt that same type of way. Dan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is M C G A U G H. -E oh, okay, not yes. even close. Okay. Yeah, definitely not even close. Um, but as of now, apparently he is still under contract with the Giants. 
He has already spoken to the Chargers. And then I believe just over the weekend, Dan, uh, a member of McGahee's crew, Anthony Blevins, who's actually going to be coaching in the East-West Shrine game, um, also part of that Giants unit, which was probably one of the, the – Again, we talked about a few bright spots for special teams. This may have been one of this was definitely one of the few spots for the Giants team collectively as a whole. Their unit ranked 11th this year in special teams, regardless of what you want to say about them offensively or defensively. But this was a unit that actually produced in the positive for them. So the Chargers have been sniffing around there. We'll obviously time will tell as far as who's going to be the new special teams coach for this unit moving forward. And hopefully as a group, we're definitely going to get better special teams play that we got in 2021. And if you don't believe that, and I know a lot of people were referencing it, but look at what the, what happened to the green Bay Packers in the last waning minutes of their playoff game, not just from the standpoint that their punt was blocked because that certainly happened to the chargers a couple times this year, but just even the last play lining up for a field goal, there was only 10 guys on the field. I mean, come on for crying out loud. Uh, the Chargers just collectively have to get better from a special teams perspective, both on the coverage and the return capabilities. So let's hope that whoever it is that they're going to bring in and whoever the Chargers choose to, as you said, Dan, prioritize those some of those late draft picks to add, not just for depth purposes, but more importantly for special teams, that this unit is going to improve in 2022. So I think... Like as we kind of round out this episode, I, I think it's important as we kind of set the stage for kind of the next call it two or three months of we have the draft, we have the combine to kind of look at prospects. We've got a bunch of free agents. We've got guys who have to resign. I think it's important for folks to kind of keep snapping back to like, what are those big rocks and how can we attack those? In my opinion, for example, like when we start talking about, as you know, Jake, we love this part. We start talking about all the draft prospects and all the positions and all the groups and things that we can potentially go after. Obviously, we're talking about free agency that we want, potentially coaching. There are so many paths to success for this Chargers offense or this Chargers offseason. Excuse me. For example, let's say the Chargers go crazy on an interior defensive line in free agency. We hear all kinds of folks talking about like, oh, we got to draft Jordan Davis. If the Chargers stack up on interior defensive line in free agency, that need for Jordan Davis is not nearly as high to where you could potentially go get a right tackle in round one. And I would argue you could probably get a much better value at interior defensive line in round two, three, four, five, six, seven than you can in round one. Now, that being said, you could also go out receiver. Chargers can go get Mike Williams. All of a sudden, can go look for like a crazy yak burner in the draft or free agency. Need. There's there's many paths. So like when you see, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, just, we have to be patient until like the draft is over. Okay, so if the Chargers don't go out and get crazy on interior defensive line, there's still the draft. If the Chargers don't. Go crazy and fix the right tackle immediately. There's still the draft. There's a lot of ways to do it, but I think we all know like what those big rocks are. We have to fix the run defense. We have to fix the secondary. We got to sign the guys who are impact players on this team. We have to fix the depth. That's a must. And then you got to fix the right side of the line. If the Chargers can do just those five things alone, in my opinion, this is a successful offseason. Now, sure, I would like to see like a speedy burner wide receiver. I would love to get a Tyreek Hill type. That would be lovely. But like, I don't think that's necessarily like, oh, if they don't get that, this is a failure. Tom Tulesco goes out. Like that, that's one of those nice to have things that you, you see a lot of teams now, like they use that to win. Just watch Kansas City this past weekend. But those big ones. Like that's what we're going to be focusing on in the coming months is how can this team fix those issues and who can fix them? There's a lot. Chargers have a ton of money, ton of draft picks and an early draft pick, actually considering what we thought they were going to be at going into the season. 
So, Jake, before we kind of wrap up and kind of finish this off, like I, when we go into the coming episodes, which again, we're going to be talking about all kinds of stuff in the off season, all kinds of storylines. Is there any other like priority list where you're like, damn it, if the Chargers find a way to screw this up and I don't know, forget to do something. Like, is there anything else we missed that's like glaring for you? Or for listeners that you've heard? You know, as far as like glaring needs, I mean, I know I didn't get into all of the potential free agents that the Chargers are going to have coming up this year. Obviously, I talked about my top three that should be priorities and then resign. I know that there's more than that, and and those will obviously be coming up as we get closer to free agency. But and I really think it's – I think the Chargers fully understand from a – especially from a defensive standpoint, there's no way that those stats can be swept under the rug, that that's where you need to put a lot of your priority. Again, not just re-signing your own, but obviously bringing in some key free agents. But – when you really look at this, the biggest thing that we always criticize Tom Telesco for is either it's either not signing key key guys to second contracts. Has he learned to spend more money over the last couple of years? Yes, I could I could believe that the whole cheap narrative has has finally exited the window when you see of him rewarding guys like Keenan Allen and Joey Bosa and giving them big time contracts. It needs to keep going though. I think his free agent moves that he's made this past offseason, what he did in the offensive line, virtually getting rid of four out of five guys, has taken a big gamble, but it was able to pay off in a big way, in a much more positive way, and how he did it. So that was a nice win there. But Dan, just to just to compare, this is this is the biggest difference. Just think to yourself, whenever the Chargers make a move or whenever they draft. And I think this was probably put in the best perspective from what we saw in the playoff game against the Bills and the Kansas City Chiefs, and maybe even more importantly from what Dan Orlovsky said. The AFC right now has just a murderer's row of quarterbacks. Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert, you can Lamar Jackson. You can keep going on, on a lot of these aspects, but those are – the guys now in the AFC moving forward. So just think to yourself, how does this move, whether it's free agency or the draft, how is it going to make me contend with the elite of the AFC? With and that's what it is. Guys. Dan, just look at this from a draft perspective, because this is always something that we give Tom Telesco heat for. But if you look at what Kansas City has done just in the last three years, they've drafted Nick Bolton, this is, this is just this year's draft. Nick Bolton, who was a Stud. great defensive player for them this year in his rookie season. Creed Humphrey. Stud. Trey Smith. That was Stud. just in this draft alone. In the prior year, you got Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, Willie Gay, Lucas Niang, Legereus Sneed. And that was a fourth-round selection, by the way. Before that, it was McCole Harmon, Juan Thornhill, Kalen Sanders. I mean, you... They have spent the time, the homework. They've done it, and they've cashed in on it. Unfortunately, you can't say the same about the Chargers. So this is the year that Tom Telesco needs to hit the biggest home run of his life. And it cannot just be in the first two rounds of the draft. It cannot be just another Rayshon Slater and Asante Samuel Jr. moment. It cannot just be that. It has to be in both free agency and the draft. And he has to draft well beyond two rounds. And for God help me, <laughs> if Joshua Palmer is an indicator that drafting in round three is not going to be a problem for him, I'll take that. Just continue the trends moving forward. But you have to get more guys that are going to be able to contribute and, of course, have the coaching staff there to develop them properly. I think you have that, or at least it's in the right direction at the very least. But Tom Telesco needs to do this, or God help me, he should be gone following the 2022 season. I'll say it now, and I'm not afraid to say it. I know people have been saying it for years. I know people wanted him gone yesterday. But if you can't get the job done with these type of assets at your disposal— then the time has unfortunately 
come for Tom yeah. Telesco. This is kind. This is kind of like uh, this is it. Like if you can't if you can't resolve a team that has Justin Herbert and company with this much free agency and this much cap space slash draft capital, like there really is no excuse anymore. Like th- this is the season. I think everyone went into this Brandon Staley thing of like year two. Like that's when we have to go in and you hear the whole all in thing. So um, we're going to kind of wrap it up for this one as we kind of set the stage for what's going to be coming in the next few months. Stick with us. This is probably arguably, this is Jake's favorite time of year. Now we get to talk about not even arguably, man, it's definitively the cat is out of the bag. We are officially in off season mode draft prospects. We get to talk about free agents Jake, we're not even getting into the draft prospects yet, which we're going to have a series all on draft prospects. Of all of the draft prospect groups, which position are you most looking forward to talking about? I mean, it's hard to ignore the defensive line because there are some great guys, not just in round one, but beyond that. I actually really like what I see from some of these right tackles, to be perfectly honest with you. The Chargers could be in a good position at 17 to draft a, draft a good one, even looking past that in rounds two and three. There are a couple there. I'm actually really intrigued about this corner class and this wide receiver class. Dan's trying Love to convince the me class. about the possibility of a wide receiver at 17. Do I see it? No. But – but as as Dan talked about, do you need a yak receiver? Could that definitely make a difference for this team? Damn straight, because it seems to always make a difference for the Kansas City Chiefs. So it couldn't hurt to get something like that. And there are some intriguing names when it comes to yak speeders in this draft. Ain't that true? All right, Jake. Um, I know it has been a bit. We went a little long today, but. Uh, I think it's healthy to somewhat like air out the dirty laundry of what is actually the problem and what needs to get fixed. Uh, for Jake Hefner, you can find him at Jake D Hefner, myself at Chargers Homer. Again, like, subscribe, follow us everywhere you find your social media outlets as well as anywhere you get your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube. Uh, we will catch up with you guys in a bit as we get going on all things free agency slash draft prospects. Uh, lots of things coming, special guests, giveaways, things like that. Uh, we're going to be uh, <laughs> doing all kinds of events, actually. So stay tuned for that as we give you guys more updates there. Until then, have a great rest of the week. Enjoy your January. While well, you still have it, it's already February. Isn't it? It's almost February. We have like a week left until it's already February, Jay. <laughs> this yep. is crazy. Where did the time go? All right, guys. Have a great rest of the afternoon, evening, morning, and we will talk to you next time on Chargers Unleashed. Okay.